I'm Justin. Thanks for coming. Um, two PSAs before I start, in case you didn't know. In an hour, if you have a phone from the United States, your phone's going to buzz. Um, the alert's going out. So I'm kind of sad that it's not happening during my talk because uh, that sounds like a fun time. <laughs> um, but don't be worried. That's what happens. Second thing I just want to say real quick is if you're local to LA, um, there's also another conference that's always in LA called Southern California Linux Expo that I've been going to for over a decade and I'm helping plan. Um, and we have a DevOps days and a Kubernetes day and a, a cloud track and containers are very welcome. So if you're ever interested in coming to that or speaking, uh, please find me because our CFP is open right now and I love helping new people give talks because it's a lot of fun. Um, and I've been giving talks for a long time. I've been going to conferences for a long time and I'm a very competitive person. As a matter of fact, I'm sure I'm more competitive than everyone in this room. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to prove it uh, by telling a little story about 2015 when I went to my first DockerCon. I was in San Francisco. And there was an app, just like there is for this one, and there was a scavenger hunt as part of DockerCon. And, and you could go find the things. You had to talk to booths. You had to take certain pictures. You had to submit it. And whoever submitted all the correct answers first won an Oculus Rift, the dev kits. Back in the day, they were hard to find. They were really expensive. And so I said, forget all the talks. I'm doing that. <laughs> I, I have to win uh, this, this Oculus. I was like, that sounds like a fun time. So the first two days of the conference, I just went and talked to every vendor. I did all the check boxes. And I submitted the, the uh, scavenger hunt questions first, and I won. While I was doing that, there was other like side quests <laughs> um, from some of the vendors that also had their own little competitions. And one of them was Weaveworks, who had this new thing called WeaveNet, which showed you your networking between containers, and it was pretty amazing. And they had a competition for the best PR at the conference would win an Apple Watch. I was like, sweet, I'm doing that one too. So I left the party early, I went back to my room, I spent a couple hours setting up WeaveNet. And at the time, I had a MacBook Air uh, running Fedora Linux. Not recommended. Uh, but that's, that's what we had. And uh, so I was going through the documentation, getting it set up. And the docs were wrong for, of course, Fedora on a Mac. And so I sent a PR to fix their docs. And I was like, hey, I, I got to the point where it's running, but you know, here's a PR just to get help other people in the future. And I don't know what other PRs came in during the conference, but I won. <laughs> I won both competitions. And I'm leaving DockerCon. I'm just like, this was the best conference I've ever been to. <laughs> the swag here was simply amazing. Uh, but when I got home, I remembered that I don't have an Apple Watch. <laughs> this is a first, or an Apple uh, iPhone. This is a first gen Apple Watch. You couldn't do it with anything else. And I also didn't have a Windows PC to play at Oculus. <laughs> so while I won uh, both those competitions, um, the real winners were uh, the Christmas recipients that year, <laughs> where <laughs> Uh, it made wonderful Christmas gifts. Um, and then I, I got home and I realized I still, I still had to learn about this container thing. Because <laughs> it was something that I, I still I wanted to learn about. And I was like, how do I figure out what this is all about and what it's going to do? Because I'm a sysadmin by trade. And, and as a sysadmin, we have lots of ways to containerize things and package things up and send them to people. And so the way I learn new technologies is by associating it with an old technology that I understand, or at least I think I understand. And in that case, I also love to do it if there's an analogy or something in the physical world. If there's something that I can equate a new technology to that it looks like or acts like an old thing. And, and this talk title is, is about me thinking about containers as this nature container thing of an egg. And I thought, you know, sure, it, it contains things. It has some complex things inside, and it's kind of a safeguard around a thing, and you can put it in a carton and ship it places. Um, but the title actually came from me as a child uh, remembering this old ad. And if you remember the slogan from, <laughs> if anyone's old enough to remember, this is a commercial that was a, a whole series of things. And um, there it goes. There is fresh as the breeze. Eggs come to you fresh every day. Serve them any way you please. Eggs are natural and economical, so keep enough on hand. Nature made them nice and neat. High in protein and only 80 calories each. Eggs are a natural wonder for meals, snacks, appetizers, whatever. All you do is heat and eat. Eggs don't run out. The incredible edible egg. 
And it was this whole series of commercials that the the egg department, you know, like whoever whoever's behind eggs was like trying to get you to use more eggs. And I was like, well, like, but I just eat them for breakfast. And and they're showing in that, you're like, well, have them as a snack. And I'm like, not really the first snack I think of, but sure, like maybe someone likes eggs. But containers in, in OCI images are kind of universal that way. And, and I realize more and more that I use them for a lot of things that don't look like maybe what they were intended for. I use them all over the place, and I wanted to show some of those things today. Uh, but again, as a sysadmin, I was skeptical. This wasn't something that I'm like all in, because I assumed that it was going to be all containers, or it was going to be the other things we have, the DEBs, the RPMs, all of the other formats. These were at war, right? And like one was going to win. And I was absolutely wrong about that, because they all exist still, and they all are needed still. And when I think of eggs, you know, that's like a natural way to package food. Uh, but in technology, we have these things called zips, right? Like a zip file takes multiple files and puts them into one. And that's like the whole goal of a zip, right? It's like, like hey, I have 10 files and I want to give them to you. How do I do that? And, and you can do that by just putting them in this one thing. It doesn't even have to be compressed. Like I can just put one after another and send you this one file. And it helps with human error because you're going to mess it up less if I gave you five different files or 10 files versus giving you a zip and say, just extract this. And again, physical analogies, this was a way to give people multiple files as one thing. It was one object. It actually is a floppy, not three and a half. It's a <laughs> uh, but you could put multiple files on here, put it in your computer, and it would run. It's a portable way to give someone multiple files and, and let them not mess it up. And, and I could just, the computer runtime, like, we have today, we're just recreating all of these technologies in different form factors. Uh, but this was a great way to send files to someone and say, here you go, please, please run this. And zips, as an evolution of that, is, is fine, but it doesn't do all of the things that we might want for handing someone some files. Um, there's no metadata. I can't go find them in a repository. There's no installer. Um, there's not much of a like distribution system, unless you're using Lambda, <laughs> uh, for zips. Um, this isn't something that is as, as ubiquitous and as easy to use as being able to search for something and add versions and all that stuff. You get up with those crazy long zip names that are, you know, whatever. Um, but as a sysadmin, we have something else that does something similar. Right? Like deb packages, uh, this is the top of a control file for a deb package. If you've never had to write a control file for a Debian, you are lucky. Uh, but Debs are, are very much, like, it's structural. And, and what you do to create a Deb is you write this one control file that gives you that metadata, and then you lay out all your files in a directory structure that's intended for where it's going to go. And I can say very structurally, like, this is where my app goes, this is where the libraries go, and the end goal is that's going on a system that runs the Debian package manager, because those file systems are similar. And that works, but it's, kind, it's convoluted. If you've ever done it, there's like 10 different commands to like repackage these things and to share them and to, you have to upload them to a registry which has different commands to create the metadata and allow people to search for it. All that stuff gets really difficult and complicated because we took the, the initial destination of it's going to run on a file system and we worked backwards from that on how do we get to that file system layout. And RPMs aren't much better. Uh, they, they have very similar things, but they have these things called macros, too, um, which are, are weird ways to add more complexity inside the spec. <laughs> we could say, hey, actually, what if it didn't have to be fully structural, and we could do a bunch of stuff as part of the RPM in macros and variables and different things that allowed us to do more things? And, um, and, and that maybe helped. <laughs> it helped move some of the complexity if it had to be a file system. Uh, does anyone know what a deb file like what the format is, it's not a deb file. It's an AR file. It's an archive file. It's, it's literally like before tape archives, TARS, we had archives. And that's literally like, so we had archives. And RPMs is a CPIO. <laughs> it's the last time you heard of a CPIO file. If you have a friend that's giving you CPIO compressed files, they are not your friend. But 
all these things worked for us because they allowed us to ship something to someone. We can get the repository, we can get the metadata, we can do this stuff that was required for sharing software. But again, they're very complicated. And if you've heard of FPM, it stands for Effing Package Manager. And, and it is a command line version of some of those tools. And so someone said, well, what if we didn't need to have those spec files and those control files? And what if we could just do it all with flags on a command line? It sounds like a very sysadmin thing to do. <laughs> Untrackable in gits, and one person knows how it works. And that sounds fantastic. Uh, but this ends up being a make target. Or like at some point, you're like, make the RPM. And it's FPM that spits out all the files and does all the stuff. Uh, and this is actually good for some people and useful because they might be more familiar with it. And it's a little more approachable than learning the directory structures and the control files. And then the Docker file was kind of born, um, which is almost a mashup of those two things, where we have a file that is a spec, and it has some structure to it, but it's a little more approachable for sysadmins, uh, at least, for having familiar commands that I can run and, and reuse. I didn't have to recreate everything in the ecosystem of a Debian file or an RPM. I could take what I knew about Linux and reuse that to package the thing I was going to eventually ship. And that was good and bad, because it's great to start. And as many of if you're here at DockerCon, you've probably seen some crazy Docker files that <laughs> have more backslashes <laughs> than you know, commands. It's just, how, how is this even possible to fit the entirety of a system build in you know, a thousand lines of a Docker file? But it's still a great portable way to create these OCI images. And, and that's the thing, obviously, I, I want to talk about is that image format. There's two amazing things that I think Docker files and OCI images did that are not available on anything else. And the first one is that first line there, the from. Because when I used to make spec files regularly, the only way to from something was to go find the git repo and copy the spec file and paste it in a new repo. And that was how we did from back in the day. It worked for Jenkins, it worked for RPMs and dev files, and, and from was you had to know the best source repo to then copy it from. And, and putting that as a first line in a Docker file lets you skip all that. You can find the best version that you want to use by just knowing the name of the image you want to use. And layering on top what it is that you wanted to do. You can't do that with RPMs and DEBs. Like I, I can extract an RPM. I can then go in the file system and modify my files. And that was literally like the workflow of config management. Right? Like install the package, layer the stuff, start the service. And that whole life cycle got collapsed into Docker. It got collapsed into containers, where I don't need to do those three steps anymore. I don't need those three things. I can do it with one thing. And that's super powerful. And those layers, that from, is just, you know, obviously, like, you have your file system again. And this is similar to what we were doing with dev files. And it was like, well, this is a file system. Again, you can do it from scratch. And just throw your single binary in there. And, and the first time I saw someone putting a, a Go binary in a container, I was like, why are you doing that? It's a Go binary. Just ship the Go binary. And, and I was wrong because of all the other benefits around the ecosystem of containers. Because we can get this file system layering, and, and we actually don't care to keep it clean. These are isolated environments on the file system, and so people put whatever they want. I used to be a real purist for Linux file system hierarchy, <laughs> and, and I was you know, at multiple jobs arguing that we need to keep opt clean, and we needed to do things properly in the file system. And then in Docker, I just don't care. Like, it's just wherever it makes sense for your team and for the people developing the applications, put it in there. And that's OK, because it's isolated. What's ever going to help you run the production system the easiest is, is probably the right thing to do. And it used to be that we'd go to all these different systems, we'd SSH into all of them, and if the file system didn't look the same, then we were lost. And now it's on a containerized level. It's per app. It doesn't matter what the file system is. 
Of course, that also has downsides where uh, people pull in some things they maybe didn't want to pull in, right? Like these images got larger and larger. And, and they didn't do some things that uh, maybe they should have done um, by, by t removing some things or ad adjusting things. But that from argument is still so powerful because it accelerates how much you can do without needing to learn the entire ecosystem of something else or how the actual Linux, your destination Linux works. All this stuff didn't matter. The first time I built a container, uh, I was creating bare metal systems, and they were Red Hat based. And I had a lot of kickstart files. Kickstart files are the automation for Red Hat to be able to spin up and install without needing to click through things. And so I took about 90% of my kickstart file, and I copied it into a Docker file. <laughs> I put a run at the beginning and a million backslashes. <laughs> I said, this should work. And sure enough, it did. And that was kind of amazing. It was 60 gigs, which, especially at the time, sounded humongous. Like, who has 60 gigs to ship around? And, and now that's actually kind of common for some people, where we have AI models, we have uh, Windows containers, we have uh, game builds. All of those things are not small. And I thought this 60 gigs was just like, oh, I, I messed up. Like, this is, this is a problem. Um, and I couldn't put it in a registry. It was too big for any registry. So I exported the tar, and I threw it on NFS, and I went to another machine, and I ran it. And I'm like, that, I can't believe it worked. But that gets me to, like, the next stage of, of why these containers are really useful. And it's, it's a little bit of a, you know, it's not just the container itself, but it's how it's stored in a registry, right? Because... We used to have registries for dev files. I mean, we still have them, RPMs, devs. There's all these repositories for sources. Uh, but Docker did something that was a little different than what those other repos were doing with manifests. And I want to show you manifests a little better because it's easier for me to show than talk about it. Make sure my computer doesn't fall off this little stand here. So I have two computers here. Um, they're both different computers. They're actually back at my house. Um, and they're both different architectures. And usually, how we get around two different architectures is, is when we do the install of an operating system, we download the right architecture, right? Like, I have to, I have to know the destination architecture. I have to know it's going to be a, you know, ARM or x86 or whatever. And, and then when I install it, all of the things just work magically because they've all been configured to do so. All of the repositories for packages, they've been built for that architecture because my repository URL, where I actually go fetch the stuff, is different. And it's transparent to me, mostly. But as someone who has to administer those things, like, oh, I need to know where you're pulling from, and I need to make sure that the path in the repository is set up correctly, because there's a variable somewhere in there that says, this is ARM, this is x86, whatever. But when I do it with Docker, like I, I actually send it that information on the fly. And that's really cool, because you can see here, you know, obviously I got the ARM build here, and I got the x86 build over here, if I could scroll just enough. And I was kind of like, well, how does that work? Like, how are, we, how are we actually doing that? And that all comes down to these manifests. Oh, come on. Am I on the right system? Yeah. There we go. If we look at that image, there's 11 different supported platforms. Architectures, there's Windows in there. There's all these different Linux builds. And, and that's not something that I was used to seeing with any other package manager and any other way to, to share files with someone. I couldn't give you this and run it on all of those systems. And the secret comes down to these manifest lists and how that manifest list works. Where 
the manifest in the registry builds in literally like a router. And that's kind of amazing, where it's this static router based on the type. So this is image layer 8. There's one. So there's my Linux AMD64. And it points me to that layer. And dynamically, my system, when it sends that information, gets routed to the right package. And, and that was a that was just like an eye-opener for me. We're like, wait a minute, we can move this from necessarily just the client having to pick which endpoint to go to, to having the registry store that information to route not only what architectures and platforms it supports, but where to fetch it. I was like, so wait, what else can we put in this system that allows us to do this routing? Because that's really cool. Because if this is just containing files and it's extracting it as a zip and it stores some metadata about it. There's got to be other ways to use that. And one of my favorites is, is Helm charts. If you're using Kubernetes, Helm charts are a bunch of YAML files with some Go templating. And you send it some variables. But like, how does that work? And if I look at, I'm going to use my history here. Oops. Let's see if that actually works. I, I think my connection is a little bit uh, rough. <laughs> oh. There we go. This should clear up once I hit enter. Um, we can curl the endpoint for a manifest. And this is the, the Carpenter Helm chart. And let's go up. Just a little bit. And we can see here we have a new media type. And, and this media type allows us to package pretty much anything in a registry as an OCI image. Because I can know at when I try to pull it down, hey, what are you trying to pull down? Are you trying to pull down an application? Are you trying to pull down a Helm chart? What is it that you're actually trying to pull down? And, and again, these are just blobs that that manifest points me to. And so I can find that blob, which is this whole URL. I can uncompress it, and I can untar it. I can extract it. And I can see the files in it. And that's everything that's in that OCI image. It's not what I traditionally would think of as an application. It's not a Docker file, or it was a Docker file, but it's not what I thought, oh, I should be shipping only applications here. And if obviously people are doing, you know, CI CD in containers, right? Like you're already running CI CD, you get clean environments. And a lot of times uh, people don't even think, like, what about what about those command lines, right? Like I have mQuery and, and manifest tool. I didn't have those locally installed. Those are containers. They're running a binary that I pulled in. And so I'm I'm running my applications in containers. I'm packaging the templates for them as Helm charts. I'm actually running the command lines themselves to deploy and use them as containers. I was like, how far does this rabbit hole go? And there's a couple other tools that I really like for this type of, like, let's use a container as a, as a package. Um, one of them is called bin, and I think I have it up over here. Um, bin is like a package manager-ish for GitHub binaries, where you can just point bin to a GitHub URL and it'll download the binary from it. But it also works with, with Docker containers. You can treat a Docker container as a binary. And I can do like a, a bin install. Oh, that's not actually the one I want. I'm probably on the wrong system again. Let me find one. I, I did this in multiple terminals, and now I'm all thrown off. I'm sorry. There we go. Oh, it already exists. I was practicing. That's good, right? Um, so if I look at 
that file. It's just a bash wrapper around running the Docker command, right? Like bin can do this and I can just have this repository of containers that run like any other normal command line would. And I couldn't, like, I, I kept going back and forth on how, how, how much can I do with containers, right? Like, I always look a, at them as, as this is just a, a thing that we package applications in. Um, but what if I told you that my computer here isn't actually running Ubuntu, right? Like, it says it's Ubuntu. It looks like Ubuntu. Um, but I can guarantee you that this little Surface Go does not have an NVIDIA GeForce GTX in it. Um, my actual system is, is Fedora, or Fedora-based. Um, and what I'm using is something called DistroBox. And DistroBox is a way to take that packaging one step further. Here's an Ubuntu toolbox that I tend to run a lot of my development tools in because it's an easy way to keep it updated, keep it fresh locally, and have it be disposable enough for what I actually need. But also, have it be flexible enough for using it for whatever. So here I am inside of another distro box, and I can run any tool that's local on the host, like XEyes. And even though I'm in a container, if you've ever run GUI apps from within a container, sometimes that's difficult to set up. And I can even look at my host here, and I don't have it installed, but I can export it. I can export binaries from within this container to my host. And now, if I go to my host, it, it runs eyes, right? Like that's, these are all things that you can do, um, but even it integrates into the UI where this maps program isn't locally installed. It's coming from DistroBox. I can do it for GUI apps. I can do it for CLIs. I can do it for all these things that work in my development cycle. And I can still, there's maps. <laughs> Took a little while. Um, all of these things just work as, as you would expect them to by layering these containers. But that's not even the end of it, right? Like if I, I don't know where eyes went, doesn't matter. If I look back at this system, this is running a distro called Bluefin. Um, there's DistroBox, which is part of this universal blue packaging. Um, and it's based on Fedora Silverblue, which has what's called OS Tree, which is like a Git repository for your file system. It, it, it stores your entire file system in this trackable version. It's read-only. If you're familiar with Nix OS, it does a very similar thing. But one of the cool things here is, is Bluefin uh, is a developer-focused version of it. And it gives me all my dev tools, like DistroBox, like Docker, uh, like IDEs that I want. And then it packages all those up as containers. And I can look at my file system is going to reboot between these partitions, completely deployed from a container. I think I'm like six levels deep now. <laughs> of maybe I've made some bad decisions, but the really cool part is how disposable it all is and how flexible that format is. Where again, I can package these files, they can be Helm chart files, but they also can be a whole operating system. And I can use my entire system from container images, develop on them, use DistroBox for my tooling that I need, or pull them down directly, and then deploy apps, all from OCI image specs. I even have a version of Bluefin called Bazite, which I run on my Steam Deck, and I play games with. And it does the same stuff where it pulls down these container images, and, but then it runs applications like normally it would. And a long, long time ago at conferences, there used to be like this goal of like, well, what if our whole desktop was containerized? <laughs> and it would seem like this weird idea that no one should ever do. And I kind of found myself falling into it by accident. 
because I was familiar enough with the format. It was flexible enough to allow us to do anything we wanted with it, uh, even maybe some things we shouldn't be doing. Um, I have even, on top of Kubernetes, run these systems. Right? Like you can have a remote system uh, and, and still run all of the stuff in a container with the hardware acceleration you want, and um, even gaming. Right? Like th this, is, this is how a lot of like, game streaming works, where they're packaging gaming inside of these OCI containers, they're mounting it in, and they're streaming the display out to you. This was just a sample of what I thought of. I was just going down the list. I'm like, well, where do I use it? <laughs> what, are, what are things that I'm doing with OCI containers? Um, if you're using code spaces or, or dev pod or git pod, those are all container-based environments. Um, OS tree, like I mentioned, there's even, if you want to write directly to the hardware and not have this AB switching in OS tree, there's an OCI to disk uh, um, project, part of Tinkerbell. And it'll allow you to, again, package up your OS and just spit the files on disk. And that's that flexibility of how do I fetch that, and then how can I route that manifest of this is an x86 box, this is an ARM box, whatever. And I may have made some bad choices along the way. <laughs> I may have gone a little bit too far with what flexibility we have with this stuff, but I thought it was incredible. And as I was thinking of this talk and just thinking how much my workflows and systems and everything that I do has changed over the years, ever since that first DockerCon, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe that this wasn't a RPM versus containers, but in reality, containers kind of won for me in a lot of ways because I, I use them everywhere for most everything I do. And that's all I have to say. So uh, thank you for coming. If you have other ways that containers are being used that I haven't talked about, I would love to hear them because I find it fascinating. And yeah, have a great DockerCon. <laughs>